Alrighty. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> Alright, well, there have been some, uh, you know, things on my mind, Gary. And, um, I don't know. I just... How do I put this? I, I've heard a lot of phrases over the years with... Uh, you know, the, you know, the revolution's happening next week or, or something to that effect. But like one of these phrases I keep hearing over and over again is really about the line in the sand. I remember even Mike, there was a video up on YouTube with Michael Batnarik saying about, uh, this has got to be your line in the sand. You've got to stand and defend it or, or something that degree. And I've heard all sorts of other people mentioning this. So I don't know. I mean, do you think that, do you think the line in the sand well, is overused or what? Well, there are a couple of phrases. When they come to get my guns, I'm going to give them one bullet at a time. And uh, uh, we've drawn a line in the sand. When they step over that line, it's time to do something. And, you know, Waco was, I guess, the first time I really heard line in the sand. I don't know how many times. I was down there for uh, 50 49 days, I think, and 48 days. And I don't know how many people I talked to on the phone, but everybody's talking about Waco. This is the line in the sand. If they do anything to those people inside there, this is after the first couple of days, the people in there, that's the line in the sand. And if they cross that and do something to those people, that's it. We're going for it. And quite frankly, when I left Waco, I was ready for the second revolution to start because of all this. <laughs> Uh, let's call it rhetoric. Rhetoric. Let's call it what is what it is. Now, some people have gotten creative and uh, talk about a um, a rope of sand, and I think they're both as uh, <laughs> demonstrative of the what they're talking about. I mean, whether it's a rope in the sand or a line in the sand, the thing is, you can move that sucker and move it again and move it again and move it again and move it again, and, move it again and you know, it's. Uh, um, Next week, next week, next week. Yeah, yeah, and funny you should say next week. I mean, I've been listening to the intelligence report recently just because I, like I like to pay attention to a couple other people in the alternative media and just and kind of see what, uh, what they're kind of jawing on about. And, um, you know, one of the other guys is mentioning mainly about how he's basically giving the impression that because of the uh, supposed additional gun control measures following Sandy Hook that uh, – that the revolution is happening next week because it's going to be it's going to be a universal gun ban and I could have sworn I heard something like that before like back in I think it was during the Tea Party era back in 2009 when Obama first got in and it's like oh he's a, he's a commie socialist fascist and he's going to run the country and the ground and the debt and some other five or six other things we got to have a revolution now, and it's been like, what? He's now just got into his second term? Uh, well, the current gun ban craze came as a result of Newton in the uh, Newtown, I'm sorry, Connecticut. And it's interesting, and it's in light of how many, what was 28 children died there or something like oh, that? Oh, it's a really low number compared with, you know, drone strikes and all sorts of other crap the government's done, yeah. Yeah, let me read you a list. <laughs> I just happen to have it here in front of me. Oh, no, demo, <laughs> demo side. <laughs> Melissa Morrison, age 6. Lisa Martin, age 13. Sheila Martin, age 15. Mina Schneider, age 2. Serenity Jones, age 4. Startle Summers, age 1. Bobby Koresh, age 2. Star Howell, age 6. Cyrus Howell, age 8. Abigail Martinez, age 11. Audrey Martinez, age 13. Crystal Martinez, age 3. Isaiah Martinez, age 4. Joseph Martinez, age 8. Chica Jones, age 2. Little One Jones, age 2. Dalen Gent, age 3. Pages Gent, age 1. Rachel Sylvia, age 12. Hollywood Sylvia, age 2. Chanel Andrade, age 1. Unborn Child, Unborn Fetus. Wait, 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 they count, wait, wait, the fetus is now a human being now? Wait, did I miss something? They were listed as those killed in Waco. They would have been born. It wasn't abortion. Well, oh. it wasn't. You know, wait, <laughs> they would have died in Waco. Those were the children that died in Waco. Now, back then, there was a, a song that uh, Carl Klanger wrote called, called 17 Little Children. You may have heard it. Yeah. Uh, at the time, he thought it was 17. Uh, but those, 
Those were the children that died in Waco as a, a consequence of the government's efforts to collect a tax on full automatic weapons if they did, in fact, exist. Um, so, so here, this many years later, what are we, 19 years, uh, 20 years later, almost Some, 20 years later, yeah, something like we've that. got uh, 28 children die and, and, and people are talking about lying in the sand again. Well, it's moved 20 years. That's, that's a pretty flexible line. Um, you remember the article I wrote recently on the blog, uh, the, the, the other not so thin line. Yeah. Excellent bit. Yeah. I love that thing. Yeah. And, and what I talk about, there is a line that goes from left to right, no political affiliation aligned with this. I'm just going left to right because we read from left to right and left side is where people enter the Patriot community and the right side is where the people, uh, have really gotten, <laughs> to where there really is a line in the sand that they're ready to go. Now, I got involved in the Patriot movement to some degree back in the 80s, and it was Internal Revenue Service. That was it until Waco. Actually, in uh, late 92, I started contemplating, and on February 5th, probably the first edition of Outpost of Freedom newspaper, and you know, I was going beyond just IRS then. I was getting frustrated as I met people and learned other things. So uh, somewhere around 1992, you could say, or maybe 83, I entered the left side of that line. Now, when we, and I had moved along quite a ways. I'd been moving for, what, uh, 10 years when Waco came up. But when Waco came up, there was a big, if you look at the thickness of the line indicating the number of people in the line, a big bubble came in with Waco, but that bubble was, insignificant compared to the one that came up uh, what about five years ago when the economy started to fall apart and the Tea Party movement came into being. But all these people are entering on the left side and then some move faster and some move slower so that Waco bubble has drawn out. Some people have fallen out or fallen back and others are, have moved ahead. It's gotten thinner. But that big bubble from five years ago is, is, is still fairly large but it seems to be stretching out the right a little bit. But now, if you take any person on that line, some might have a line in the sand that's over towards the left, and others might have it not until you get all the way over to the right. Um, some of us grow too old to really do anything about the line in the sand by the time we get to that point. But the, how can you define uh, a point that you're really going to do something? Now, another thing that you hear is uh, when they come to get my guns, and, and I alluded to that a few minutes ago, they'll get it a bullet at a time, <laughs> but that's the last stand. That's not a line in the sand. That's self-defense. That's, that's your right, but more than likely it's going to be the last right that you ever defend, uh, defend for yourself because when they come to get your guns, if you fight back, more than likely they're going to upgun the heck out of you, and it will be your last fight. Um, so it's hard to say what the line of uh, the sand can really be. It's a, a false hope or perhaps a... Uh, it sounds like a psychological trick to me, if anything, like delaying it until later, like, oh, yeah, well, at some random point in the future when some very vague condition has been achieved or happening, then then we're going to act. But for right now, let's not stir the pot too much. I mean, that's what it sounds let's, like to me. Let's call it an expression of bravado. <laughs> I think that's probably, you know, I was trying to think of a phrase, and an expression of bravado, it doesn't mean that the bravado is there. It's an expression of bravado. Um, and, you know, there's conditioning is an interesting aspect. The military has gone to doom type games. They're a lot more sophisticated than doom, but you shoot somebody and blood flies and people fall down and they're realistic looking. Uh, they're using that now to condition the soldiers to uh, uh, be more killers than they were in previous wars. In fact, you know, previous wars, there was a problem getting some people to shoot at other people. They'd shoot over their heads or down at the ground. They just uh, had an, a revulsion to that, but uh, in Iraq, I remember, you know, I've got the footage on the webpage where the uh, injured Iraqi, I don't know, for want of another term, I'll call him a freedom fighter, not to start a debate, but he was the enemy, and he was on the ground, and he was down 
below where this guy was, and uh, this guy keeps shooting at him and missing, and finally he hits him, and the body slumps over dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and the guy afterwards, they interviewed him, and he's gleeful. Did you see that? I killed that guy, or something like that. Right. Uh, that attitude didn't exist in Vietnam, and at least in the people that I met that how killed do you somebody. Well, how do you mean? What do you mean that oh, he attitude? was gleeful because he'd killed this guy. Oh. And, you know, it used to be the military saw the benefit of taking prisoners for intelligence information. How, what information was lost because he decided to kill this guy who was so injured that he couldn't even crawl away. And it was just a matter of time before they rec could recover him as a, a prisoner and get, get intelligence from him. So there's been a shift in the attitude, and that's a result of conditioning. Now, let's look at another form of conditioning. Had so many lines in the sand now that, hey, they're just old hat. Now, next time the government does something wrong, I'm going to draw another line in the sand. And so we're, are we conditioning ourselves for defeat by saying that the line in the sand that, uh, uh, you know, we've all heard about it from, uh, who was it, Colonel Travis at, at Alamo? Uh, yeah, it's who, funny. Yeah, it's funny you should mention that because that was during the Texas Revolution in 1835 and 1836, and especially at the Alamo where he told the men, look, I'm not going to force any of you to be here. But he took the and he took this sword and literally drew the line in the sand and said, "Look, if you want to stay here and pro and make a last stand, and that's pretty much what ended up happening because everybody pretty much got killed, um, then walk across that line." And I think most, if not all, of them did. It was a lot of them anyway. And I think that's where it really came from. So it's not you know strictly an American idea. It's really more of a Texan idea, technically. <laughs> Well, yeah. I, I would say that the, the concept goes back further than that. Okay, in, fair enough. In history, and I know <laughs> Texans think they're the biggest people in the world, but uh, for the sake of the discussion, we'll leave it at the Alamo, because okay. I think that that is where the common familiarity came with it. It was you know, very pronounced in uh, Disney's Davy Crockett, and uh, I've read it in, in various books about the Alamo, so we know that it, it occurred there. That's definitely... Uh, been recorded in history, but that was a line in the sand. And when you cross that line, your life was given up to the cause. And if you were lucky, you would survive. But if you weren't lucky, you wouldn't survive. It was it was an absolute and total commitment. And the way it's flung about, I don't want to say used, the way it's flung about today, it's a conditioning, an excuse not to uh, act. Yeah. Act and you know. Let's look at a, another instance uh, that we've got these militia all over the country. Say, and we're going to back the other militias if they're attacked. We're going to go after them. If the oh, police try to arrest, we're going to yeah. them. And there was an incident a couple years ago, and I thought it was rather intriguing. Um, it was called the Hootery Militia. And oh yeah, those the, guys up in Michigan. Yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah, they got acquitted uh, two years or a while well, back. Well, yeah. well, wait, wait, don't get there yet. Oh, whoops. Hoodle Reed Militia got attacked and the, or, or got arrested. A bunch of them got arrested, and the government comes out and says, these guys were going to kill cops, and we're going to take them to trial. It was about a year later. Now, during that, that first couple of weeks, first couple of months, even that first year until almost the end, and I'm not quite sure how it changed almost at the end, but I only recall one article that was supportive of the Hoodle Reed Militia. That was done by somebody that wasn't oh, associated. That's a, with yeah, yeah that's, that's a good point, Gary. Yeah, because I remember at the time when it was still very much, uh, you know, in the, in the government's, you know, uh, den. Uh, I remember on um, folks from the Patriot community treating the Hatari as if they were pariah. I remember all of that actually. Funny you should bring that up. Right, and the only the only article I can think of was one called Thought Crimes. Uh, and yeah, I think it's still on my blog <laughs> but but the, the, these are people way over on the left side of the line that's all i can figure out but the the the, the idea is here what did they look for the line in the stand came militia was being arrested they jumped at what the government and CS, cbs and cnn told them these guys were going to kill cops as a justification to move the line down the road again yeah. So that line got moved. We'll defend any militia in this country if they're attacked. Except the hoodery because they were going to kill cops, and that's bad. Well, I Suppose, don't know if that's bad yeah, or not. Well, it, supposedly, it, but, but the point is it's kind of immaterial either way. The point is 
uh, is that, yeah, I remember them being treated like pariah, and I'm only aware of really one other uh, individual. No, let, 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 let me finish on that. Sure, sure. Uh, about a week before the acquittal, an article came out in the Patriot community, basically kind of in defense of the Hootery militia, about a week, maybe two weeks before the acquittal. So after a year, somebody finally came back perhaps knowing, learning from somebody that the bill was going to come and began defending Hootery militia. Well, it's safe now because I can defend them and, and show that I really meant it back then, but I was lied to by the government. Mm -hmm. And so look at the hypocrisy in the line in the sand. Yeah, yeah. In fact, actually, funny you should mention uh, the Hatari. Um, I remember... Uh, I think you and I mentioned about this, I think I talked with you about this once before probably, when Larkin Rose came out with that article of his that was published on Cop Block about when should you shoot a cop, and I was even kind of, you see, I thought even folks within the Patriot community were going to be more receptive to it, besides just every other political dissident, you know, in these United States, and even a lot of those folks were were kind of taken aback, you know, it's the sacredness of the badge, and I guess probably somebody mis misinterpreted as, you know, something against Oath Keepers or, or people like that, but it was like, no, it's like just seriously, just in a, in a self-defense context, when should you shoot a cop? I mean, Larkin Rose even uh, did a vlog that was up on YouTube where he was explaining his article and like, look, here's you know, what I meant, you know? You know, yes, the title was intended to provoke debate and, and, and help people think, uh, but I, he's kind of he was kind of taken aback by the backlash of it, uh, especially from where it came from. But I think in a lot of ways, it he was kind of suggesting one way of actually acting on a line in the sand. It's in a very and it is a very good question. Which when should you shoot a cop? So uh, well, back in, back in 1999, I uh, wrote a, uh, it, it was an interview with John, and it was called Popping Cops, and now. Oath Keepers wasn't in existence back in 99, so when I wrote this, I didn't get as much flack as Larkin got, but basically it's talking about the same thing. Who is the first line of uh, defense of the government? It's the cop. Now, Oath Keepers wants to bring them over, but Oath Keepers wanted me off of their Facebook page because I said they're still arresting people without a warrant, and they're still shooting people uh, or searching their cars without lawful authority oh, to do so. Yeah, that's actually I didn't perfect. Get I didn't get near as much flack, but I got some flack that people, from people that were associated with law enforcement over that article in 99. Uh, oh, that's actually perfect you mentioned that because, uh, you know, Oath Keepers, they got a lot of when, – when they were starting – when they were just starting to grow, they got some flack from the corporate core mainstream media about the tent when they published uh, – when Stuart Rhodes, the founder, published – the ten orders we will not follow, or we refuse to obey, or something to that effect. And in a way, those t those ten orders are, I guess you could say, a line in the sand. But it's funny you should mention that because th th now that I think about it, I think it was like one or two of those orders they refused to obey did involve uh, basically violations of what we would understand to be the Fourth Amendment, which is about unreasonable search and seizure. So <laughs> it's funny you should mention that. Oh dear Lord. Yeah, the irony of the whole thing is in 1900, the case of John Bad Elk versus United States, where the Supreme Court determined that uh, if a law enforcement officer is making a lawful arrest, uh, and he doesn't have a warrant, proper warrant in his hands, you have every right to let the officer. And as I said in the decision, it would be a misdemeanor, no crime at all. John Bad Elk shot John Hills back. John Killsback had a rifle, but he hasn't raised the rifle, but John Bad picked his up and shot and killed him. The other deputy, I guess, left. They don't really say what the other deputy did, but, but he left. Uh, and then when I was in Waco, I looked at, uh, 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 well, the, the Waco team that we had down there, one of the guys did some research on what the law was in Texas, and both for arrest warrants and search warrants, you have a right to defense if the a uh, person serving the warrant uses more force than is necessary to serve the warrant. You have every right to use force back to the point of killing him. And I think, you know, we talked about this once before, and you even looked up those two statutes. Yeah, actually. Um, I don't remember the specific number right offhand. But, yeah, basically what it more or less says is that in Texas anyway, police brutality is illegal. 
And yeah, you can basically, you know, you can pretty much kill a cop here in Texas. And it's technic and that's according to the, the legal code here. And, and last time I checked, it wasn't like, you know, repealed or rescinded or anything like that. And so that's even according to the Texas state government, which, you know, I, I know that a lot of people think Texas is like this bastion of freedom. I mean, I was even, uh, I was even on another, I was uh, recently, uh, you know, a guest on someone else's uh, internet radio live stream podcast, Doohickey. And one of the impromptu, I guess, co-hosts was a guy from New Zealand. And he th- actually took some time and explained and said, hey, we thought Texas is this bastion of freedom and is the the core Americana. Uh, And obviously due to time constraints, I I couldn't really get into too much detail. But what I wanted to say was that, you know, there are some there are some problems here, too, even with, you know, gun control stuff, even here in Texas, as well as a bunch of other things. So I find it funny that uh, that uh, in a good way, obviously, that one of the things that even to the Texas state government will allow is that. The cop, there is a, uh, let's put it this way, there is an accountability for cops in a very real and physical sense. <laughs> well, we, you know, I looked uh, a few months back, it was Texas Penal Code Section 9.3.1, uh, paragraph C. Yeah. And uh, that was the one about arrests, which uh, the reason we looked it up is under Texas law, David Crash was justified, the people in Mount Carmel Center were justified. And shooting back at the, the police who came in and shot their dogs and started shooting up the building. They had every right under Texas law. Now, what's interesting about the law, it, I, I don't know what date that was implemented. I would imagine it was a long time ago, back shortly after the birth of Texas, mm-hmm. um, because it was a way of protecting your liberty and your property. Damn straight. So if that liberty is, and we've got states that have enacted laws to give you the lawful means of protecting that property. And then when we get a federal government out of the jurisdiction trying to take your property or your liberty away, what's happened to this country? Now, if you want to understand where the line should be, is you need to understand what the law should be and what it is still in Texas and say that the line in the sand, if somebody comes to arrest me or to uh, seize my property or search my property without a lawful warrant, I have every right to take his life. Just like you would and any th- other th- just like you would any other criminal or mugger or robber or what have you, yeah. Right. And uh well I think Bastia Ed talked about the government sneaking in the middle of the night, or uh, is the government any different than a, a burglar sneaking in the middle of the night to steal your property? They're both plundering. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you want to line in the sand, you have to understand where that line should be. Actually, it should be a line in concrete. It should be a line in the Constitution. It should be a line in the Texas Constitution in this case. It should be a line in the Texas statutes. If they cross that line, they are criminal. In their actions, and that's why that statute was written, and that's why John Bell got off of murdering a law enforcement officer, because John Bell stood for that line in the con- concrete or the Constitution, and the Davidians didn't get off because we've acquiesced to the federal governments saying the law is what we want it to be, not what the Constitution or the statutes or anything else says. So. The line in the sand has been breached so many times. It's unbelievable. And so it is, but, you know, it's, the line in the sand is drawn, it rains right away. Yeah. The, the line disappears, it's gone. It, waiting for somebody to draw it again further down the road. Yeah, and it's interesting that how you describe that, too. Again, invoking a Michael Badnarik, even when he described it, he even said, like, look, I mean, it's not really a line in the sand if you initially draw it at one point and then it's crossed or violated and then you back up. And then instead of what you're supposed to do is stand your ground and resist, if you instead, once the transgression of the trespass happens, you then back up and then draw another line, that's that's just ineffectual. That's, em- that's emptiness. That's nothing that's there. There's no resolve behind that. And in the long run, when that happens, if you, if you keep backing up every time there's a trespass, 
you're literally falling back each time as if it was a military engagement, because in some ways it very much is. You're backing up constantly until you back yourself up into a wall and there's no one else to run, and then you lose, and you know you lose your life, your your, your property, your liberty, and ultimately your life. I mean, yeah. Then you're, then yeah, then you're standing alone. Now it does two things. The one effect is it, it conditions us to keep backing up another step and another step until we're against that wall. But the other one, but to keep making for. Yeah. Every time they get away with it, they're they're encouraged, and, and the law enforcement officers believe that they have the right to do this stuff. Look, Werner in, in Tucson, you know, they, they broke his door down. They had the the battering ram there. They broke the door down. They had no right to do that. They, the whole kid, no knock warrants were almost impossible to get. You had to know there were gangsters, Tommy guns inside before you could get a no knock warrant. You had to go up and knock on the door, and there weren't that many casualties as a consequence of that. And they knew if there was a, a threat within, but they've created the threat themselves because uh, of their practices. And uh, as they get away with these, the concept of John Badalk is gone completely. The 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 Supreme Court decision that says you have a right to protect your liberty, liberty is denied if you're arrested. Unlawfully, yeah. you're detained. Yeah. The Supreme Court upheld that in 1900, 113 years ago. They upheld that, that that right is being fundamental under the concept of government that we have in this country. Where is that gone? Because every time the police get away with it, they're more empowered. We have empowered them by failing to resist. Yeah, and actually it's interesting too because I think there's also – I don't know if it necessarily qualifies, but there might be a certain level of verbicide when it comes to the word fight. Because I've seen people, yeah, I've seen people basically say, we're going to fight this, or, or battle. That's the other one. It's usually those two. This is a battle. This is a fight. And a lot of times, even if they mean it in a sense of like an intellectual contest or some sort of legal wrangling or something, um, it, I find it interesting. It's... it's uh, like, for example, like with a lot of the anti-war stuff that's been going on over the past decade or so, I've heard people use terms like, we're going to fight, uh, ironically for another reason, but anyway, putting the double irony aside, we're going to fight to try and bring our troops home, which is, you know, a laudable goal, obviously, uh, for various reasons we won't go, you know, I won't go into here. Uh, but at the same time, it's like if you, if a certain congressman like a Cynthia McKinney type or Ron Paul or whomever, if they fail in bringing the troops home, which unfortunately is what's happened, because they're still over there, then, uh, then what, you just give up and go home and like, well, I tried to fight, you didn't fight anything, you were doing kind of a diplomatic thing where you walk around, talk to people, and try to do legislative rituals and the rest of it. Or, you know, other people may say, like, uh, if somebody's getting charged with some sort of victimless crime or something, we're going to fight this in court, I've heard that one too. But technically... It, it almost seems to me, Gary, like if somebody is using the like, terms fight or battle or whatever, that should only be reserved for actual physical combat. Put another way, uh, you know, the more I study the guerrilla warfare, the more respect I have for the guys, even if I disagreed with them that, of what, for what they had to go through, different, different people in different places in history. I mean, for example, even just World War II, uh, the French Maquis, who were trying to oust uh, the Germans when they were occupying, well, specifically Paris, but, you know, France in general. Um, and this is interesting. I mean, did, did the, the uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the Maquis went up to the, to the, to the, to the, to the National Socialists and, you know, asked them nicely, like, hey, uh, you know, if we file a petition or something, would you please, you know, not, you know, be as tyrannical or something? No, I, I mean, I could have sworn they got rifles and shot government agents. <laughs> you know, that, that almost seems well, more like fighting to me. I, I, I agree. I think that there are different ways to fight. You can fight a traffic ticket. Your intention is to prevail. Uh, but I think the context that most people put it in when their, uh, their bravado is being expressed is, uh, I'm going to fight. And they don't mean that because they can't defeat it in court. They can't defeat it on the streets. They can only defeat it if, uh, defeat it if they do fight the way you're talking about. So they misapply the term. Uh, 
in, in an expression of bravado. You know, I agree with you completely, even though there are different definitions in that context, it can only be, mean one thing because there is no other battlefield to fight it on. Yeah. So, yeah, it is, it's, it's a sense of more uh, it is a correct definition of the word out of context in the sentence that they express it in. Or, yeah, or, you know, or uh, a more contemporary example, actually. Uh, when the Tea Partiers try to do what I like to call their second round, this was after the bailouts happened in 2009. I think it was like later that year or in 2010 or whatever it happened with um, with the Obamacare thing that eventually got passed later. But during that interim period, and there was a whole bunch of, you know, the corporate horror media was focusing on some degree, but the alternative media was really going nuts about it, kind of like with the current firearms bubble right now. And they were just going nuts about it. And the Tea Partiers were filing petitions and all this stuff. I remember people at that time saying, "We're fighting about we're fighting against socialized medicine." I actually I, that was a slogan somewhere, like on Tea Party Nation or, or or one of the other websites or outlets or whatever. I remember hearing that. Or even later, uh, fast forward about a little over a year and change or so, when Occupy Wall Street got started, I remember some of those guys even, and, the, and usually you don't think of those guys as part of the Patriot community even in a slight way, but. Even a lot of them were saying, "We're fighting Wall Street. We're fighting, you know, uh, you know, corporations or something." I mean, but the well, point is, I've heard this over and over again, even within the past well, few years. Look at it, though, to fight and file a petition is an effort to at least find a playing field that we might be able to fight and find victory on. To fight Wall Street by demonstrating in the, in the streets is. is is out of context. It's it's an unwinnable. Uh, they think breaking windows and keying cars is going to uh, get corporate America to stand down. I don't think so. So it's it's unbeatable. But back to the the petitions. At least that is the 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 playing field, the the game, so to speak, is defined by virtue of the fact that they're doing petitions. There's an effort, though for probably futile. At least it's in context. It fits w what they. Expressed, where anonymizing Wall Street, that is, yeah, and, and way out of context. Yeah, and and you know, I, I don't, obviously, I mean, me personally, I just don't think protesting is a. Method. Wait, let me qualify that. Sure. If, if these people are intelligent enough to to realize that they can't win by walking down the streets and yelling and screaming, mm -hmm. uh, it is possible that they're mental capacities are so limited that they honestly think that they can achieve something by this. But I think they're more trying to get on television than anything else. A little bit of the attention whore thing. Yeah. Well, right. yeah. And, 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 you know, I've, I've had serious discussions with guys who claim that they were serious private conversations. And fr quite frankly, I've had to tell them, and, you know, I, I'll probably write an article about this at some point. I put it up on the blog because it's, it's something that's been bugging me for quite a while is I honestly, just objectively speaking, I don't see how protesting works. As a, And by protesting, I mean street protests or street demonstrations is what I mean. I don't see that as, as that working to help anyone's of any political ideology, uh, helping them secure their liberties or otherwise achieve whatever other goals they may have. Um, I mean, quite frankly, just to boil it down real quickly, there's really only three outcomes I can see. I mean, either, you know, one... You're trying to basically be like a like a you know media whore and grab attention, and then that's supposedly spreading awareness, and then spreading awareness supposedly is going to mystically solve the problem that you're protesting about in the first place, which makes no sense. But that's the explanation that actually was actually a different guy actually kind of explained it pretty much that way to me, uh, uh, pretty much right off the bat. Second is where a protester does something that technically would be considered civil disobedience; he gets arrested. And then, uh, long story short, basically, he's relying on jury nullification to get him to basically not, not have him thrown in prison and hopefully establish a judicial case precedent that hopefully will mystically solve some other type of problem. And then, of course, the third, uh, the third thing, third, the third goal of protesting, I guess, would be it serves as a opportunity for like-minded individuals or activists or whatever term you want to use, dissidents, basically – 
to to get together and have a morale raising rah 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 fest. But you know, even when you consider those three, I can think of several other mechanisms or techniques to accomplish or perform any one of those functions. Uh, with you know, sans the cost of police brutality and and also and you know stuff like that, as well as increasing the effectiveness. So I don't see. But the reason I'm bringing it up, though, Gary, is that I've literally heard people well, two things. One, I've heard I've heard people say that I'm bad and wrong because I've never gone to a protest and I have no intention of going to a protest of any kind about anything whatsoever. And two, I've literally heard protesters, some guys I've talked with who really are protesters, gone to one, gone to stuff like that, you know, and all that, basically saying that, well, we're fighting. You know, we're fighting, we're protesting, we're fighting, we're, we're trying to do something against the establishment or something. I've literally told them, look, I don't see how you acting as a sign-waving coward is somehow moving the case for liberty forward. I just don't. Well, the last time demonstrations worked was in the late 60s, and it was years, and it was virtually millions of people and the interesting thing, it was a, a, a cause that could develop sympathy and expand and grow. Um, it wasn't as ambiguous as the Tea Party goals. You know, the Tea yeah. Party goals were to get representation in Washington. We saw how that worked first round. 60% of them turned against the Tea Party right after they got elected and voted for the debt ceiling increase and the uh, extension of the uh, – NDAA, I think it was. Yeah, and OWS uh, is a, was, has been a complete failure. It hasn't stopped Wall Street at all, yeah. Right, but back then, the anti-war movement was, uh, <laughs> you know, if they'd gotten the war over with, but, you know, I was there, and they weren't fighting to win the war. They were fighting to uh, hold outposts. They'd have uh, search and destroy missions, and then they'd recover back to base, and the Viet Cong would come back in. And there was a futility to Vietnam that over those many years uh, – kept growing as the body counts came back and uh, 58,000, uh, over 58,000 bodies, uh, American bodies and hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese bodies. Uh, so that was one that, that could work, but it took years. You know, the demonstration started probably 64, 65, and we got out of the war finally in 72. So it took seven years with a focus on a single objective. And one that could draw emotional support every time a neighborhood boy died in action there. But now you've got this very diverse, uh, well, divide and conquer. <laughs> yeah, article, yeah, yeah, right. They're going in a dozen directions, and, and they're splitting their forces. And so the uh, possibility of any success, unless they focus, like the Under One Banner petition, if they focus on something that is tangible, can be readily identified if they all pursue that goal we could probably uh, achieve success but uh, there's no effort in fact um, <laughs> division I'm still trying to figure out CNN gave us I think 17 stories on Newtown on the first day oh, dear God. I was counting the variations of the story Yeah. and now we've got stuff yeah. The actors did the whole thing none of the children died or all the children died somebody the other day said uh, no open caskets. I don't know. I haven't seen a, a, yeah, generally... a televised funeral, so I can't really say if the caskets were open or not. But I would imagine if the kid got shot in the head uh, with a high caliber bullet, they would not have an open co uh, coffin. But who's been in to see if the coffins are open or not? Right. So we're getting – CNN has 17 directions. We've probably got only five or six diverse directions of the Patriot community over a single issue. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and I've and I've heard it from some of the other uh, aspects of the alternative media that who are usually dissidents, not necessarily part of the patriot community. And I haven't really studied the issue, and it's not, and I don't think it's really important in in other regards. But what I have noticed is that there's been some explanations where they think it's a false flag op, and then they say, "Look, like like the one piece of footage on YouTube where the guy, uh, one of the parents or whatever, is like giggling right before he quote unquote gets into character because he starts heaving and then he gets all sad or something." And there's been, but I've seen these over and over again. There was another one with a woman, but I gotta say, Gary, it might be possible, but then again, it kind of also seems like conjecture too um it could be a lot of things who knows why he was heaving and sighing or who knows why he was giggling beforehand or any of these other bits of uh 
supposed evidence that suggests it's a false flag op, or or there was the other one too, Gary, where somebody thought that uh, some of the children that have been around, you know, President Obama, or I like to call him El Presidente, uh, was. Um, uh, I like so, to call him the bastard president, more case. How about how about the tyrant in chief? But okay, <laughs> the point is, is that. Well, you're talking about that uh, that that blonde girl with the red and black. Yeah, dress, yeah, I've, I've I've heard that one too, and I, that was maybe you know, an alternative media. Even service when I was that. a kid, <laughs> even when I was a kid, all the blonde, little blonde girls with straight blonde hair looked the same. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you put a red and black dress on, if you look the dress closely, they're not a match. They're similar, but, you know, don't make one dress and sell it and then make a different style dress. Even if the dresses were identical, that would mean it's the same girl. But I zoomed in on those pictures, and when I did zoom in, I'm doing better than when I was a kid because they did look different. Their hair was the same, down to their shoulders, nearly straight with the curl on the bottom. That was what I saw in hundreds of, or not thousands of blonde girls when I was a kid. Um, and then we've got the, the actor, the, the school teacher and the, uh, um, well, the, uh, the other lady looks like her, I can't think of what her background is, except the other woman looked like she was maybe five to ten years older than the school teacher. But, oh, that's well, right. they still, their hair was the same. Oh, hold on. Are, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I might be confusing the different women, but are you referring to the brunette woman who supposedly was sitting next to James Holmes at his trial? Or, or am I thinking of a different woman? Because there was also that's, that That's the too. same one. Oh, okay. That's the same yeah, that's the one. And it was a school teacher that apparently hid some kids. I think it was the one that hid the kids in the closet and, and saved their lives. Uh, but she died. And then there was the one with Holmes, and then there were some other pictures of her. But she looks older to me. I, you know, maybe well, one age, guy. But... Well, I remember. Well, I remember one guy on YouTube, and he basically put the footage right next to each other, and he was narrating over it. And even he said that he thinks they're two different people, especially when he flipped the. He, apparently, he can manipulate the footage, but he actually showed in in his video. He actually flipped it around and said, "Look, especially when the brunette in the in the Holmes clip when she turns." Uh, she looks very extremely different from the the woman in the side footage because he put them side by side. Uh, is is there? So I don't know, Gary. It seems like almost wanting well, to see the. So you've the heard this. You've heard this before. It's called the power of suggestion. Yeah. Watch the flame throwing tank at Waco. <laughs> the idea is presented, and you've got this image in your head, and so you look at that and say, "Hey, looks like that." Oh God! It's, if the that, isn't it? if the statement wasn't this is the same person, would these people look awfully alike? But they're not the same person. Then you would look and say, "Oh, he's right. They're not the same person." That's the power of a, a suggestion. And even though it's not on YouTube, that's why I wrote because YouTube said so. That power of suggestion, um, especially if there's not a whole lot of information to think about, yeah, uh, can be pretty successful means of advertising. Oh, and that's the British champions. Yeah, actually, that reminds me of another one. Like another one that people keep mentioning, uh, usually alternative media circles, is that the medical examiner, when he giggled or something, uh, or when he refused to ask questions in a complete and truthful manner, that supposedly that means he's in on it somehow. But it, again, it just seems like speculation and conjecture. Um, and it's worth well, let's look at alter Let's look at a couple of alternatives. He's a piss poor f uh, public speaker, and that's why he's locked in the mortuary. Uh, or right. uh, uh, he he's so emotionally distraught by what he's seen that he just uh, can't overcome that uh, emotional distress. So those possibilities, no. Well, let's not consider them because they're not suggested in the title. And let's go to the uh, the father that was supposed to be laughing. Right. Uh, before he went on and, and started crying on television or something. Uh, I know people that have lost loved ones. Uh, they don't give up life. Women are more inclined to be remorse uh, or, or in, let me put it this way, in mourning, which used to be uh, a standard. You had to be in mourning for a certain period of time uh, after something happened. But life goes on. And uh, I'm not sure that I would laugh, but if somebody said something funny, it might be a little relief, and I might laugh if somebody said something trying to cheer me up before I go on camera. Uh, 
by getting me out of that remorse or that uh, sense of loss or the emotional distress. Somebody said something humorous, and I laughed, and that brought me, brightened me up a little bit, so I did better when I went on the stage. I can't find fault with that. But to people who have not been through that, uh, who are they to judge how somebody should act under the circumstances? So do you think you he was right. gleeful that his daughter died, or do you think that perhaps some other cause that was not presented by the projection, uh, <laughs> predictive programming perhaps? Maybe. Uh, suggested predictive programming <laughs> uh, was thrown out uh, uh, to keep you from thinking that there might be something else behind us. Okay, so if I'm hearing you right, I think what you're trying to say is that since there are other possibilities or alternatives that have not been proven to be incorrect, it's, um, it is uh, premature and overly judgmental for some of the folks in the alternative media to make the assertion that this is all some evil kind of black ops cover up, false flag op, evil government thing, right? Right. Okay. Suggestive predictive programming. Let's call it what it probably is. <laughs> um, you know, one of my signatures, I'm going to read two lines from one of my signatures. The conventional view serves to protect us from the painful job of thinking. Now, the conventional view in this case is the uh, projected view. And then the other one, it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. And I think that's what's happening because have people considered what the possibilities are for the man crying? Uh, that look, have they looked closely enough at the pictures to, to really look and see if they are the same uh, person or if there are enough differences? Uh, you know, I remember back in Waco days, Linda Thompson put a picture or put a picture out of a guy that looked like. It was I no I guess it was later than that it was after ninety five she put out a picture of some a BATF guy who had different appearance and she said that looks like Tim McVeigh no it didn't look like Tim McVeigh but a lot of people bought it there was another footage that she put out this was motion picture footage uh, after the bombing at Waco and she said that guy looks like Gary Hunt that's Gary Hunt he's walking away with this short Indian looking guy well. Glenn Wilburn was one of the people that asked me to come to Oklahoma City, and I went down there and uh, uh, went to Glenn's house, and he had put these did a beautiful job putting videos of me on Montel Williams uh, and this footage of this guy walking away from uh, the the still smoking Marab building. The interesting thing about it, which Glenn recognized right away when he met me, is that guy was heavier than me. He had less hair than me and, you know, walked differently than me. I'm a surveyor. I'm used to walking out in swamps and things like that. So I have a gate that's different than that slouchy gate that guy has. I have to be careful where I put my feet. He just you know, walks on flat surfaces all the time. So there were three things. And then Thompson won. Another time had suggested that she, I don't think I ever saw it, but suggested she had uh, footage of me uh, dressed as a BATF agent. So there's all these speculations and the presentations and people with them, the people that knew me, even my wife looked at that footage and said, that guy looks a lot like you. He did. But when she looked closely, she got to see it, you know, and, and study it, she realized it, he didn't look that much like me because of his paunch and his lack of hair. Uh, but that's the suggestive pre predictive programming. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and unfortunately, a lot of the guys who are in the alternative media, and a lot of whom are you know reasonably intelligent and well intentioned, and and so on and so forth. And I and I should know because I actually know some of these good portion of them personally, actually, and and others by reputation. Um, unfortunately, uh, virtually all of them, to my knowledge anyway, are the products of public schooling. Um, every once in a while, you'll run into a homeschooler like myself, but every and 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 people who were privately schooled. And when I mean that, I mean like they learned the trivium, if you will. But the v super majority, even in the alternative media, um, they they don't know how to think, and so they're kind of a lot of them anyway. At least of the ones I know, are trying to make a good faith effort to do it, but it's still like grinding this painful thing. So when they make 
uh, baseless speculations and conjectures, I can't help but try and politely point out some things they may be missing or some, dare shall I say, logical fallacies that are there. And it, their reactions vary, sometimes hostile, sometimes sometimes not. But, I mean, you're right. Um, uh, well, look at it this way. If I have a conclusion in mind, then I'm going to wrap the facts to fit the conclusion, and I've got to discard the facts that don't match the conclusion I want. That's, again, back to my signature on some of my emails. Um, I try and not jump to a conclusion. I try and, you know, an event happened. For example, the the death of Michael. But I kind of threw that aside, and I looked at the autopsy report. I looked at the autopsy photographs. I talked to people that were there that night when he was shot. Uh, I went down to the sheriff's department, got access to the uh, evidence room, looked through that and looked at any of the evidence regarding it that I could. But I didn't come to the conclusion until after I had all this evidence. And then the conclusion, the, the death of Michael Hill, which is on my webpage, the conclusion I came through to uh, quite simply was he was shot by... And nobody had speculated this before, but the evidence is to support that he was shot, the two cops that rolled on the scene later, because the one gunshot had to be shot, taken either from a very, very tall person shooting almost straight down, or when Mike Hill was lying on the ground. He could not have been shot in the gunfight that uh, Officer May said. But see, nobody had, had even touched that because they jumped to conclusions. And then there were other factors uh, uh, where the, br the brain matter was down by his knees. How did it get down there? Well, he must have been sitting up somewhere along the line. And that then looking at the gun and the bullet that hit the gun, it appears that they propped him up to make it look like to tie the gun to him uh, and put it in his hands and then shot him. And when the bullet hit the gun, uh, Pieces of brain matter had dripped out of the hole in his head, but uh, when the gun, the bullet that hit the, the 45 splayed out, it threw little pieces of metal into his hand and his left leg. Jeez. Now, uh, how did the splaying bullet get in his left leg if he was sh the gun was shot while he was standing up in a gunfight? It couldn't. So yeah, there were I, see, I see what you mean. The ballistics don't match. Okay. Right. And so there were two, two things there uh, in particular. There are other subtle ones that are in the report, but there were two things that occurred there that made all the stories that I had heard before I got, I got there impossible to have occurred the way they were told. And it did tie these second guy coming up, and then or second and third cop. May was had a guy in the back seat who wouldn't even open his mouth. A young kid that wanted to be cop. Um, but the only thing that fit is these other guys rolled on the scene. Mike was rolling around on the ground in agony, still alive, and they shot him and it grazed his cheek and went in the top of his shoulder. That's the one that was impossible in the gunfight. Uh, then the damaged gun and the splayed bullet in his leg was the other one. So these guys must have cooperated with May to tie the gun to Mike. Mike probably didn't have a gun in his hand when the gunfight ensued. They had to tie the gun to his hand, put it in his hand, shoot the bullet, hit the gun, and the angle doesn't cut from a gunfight either. Mm. So all these things, and, but it was, it was a matter of ignoring what... Uh, uh, Mike's wife told me, uh, this guy Raymond down there, it was very helpful, but he had come to his conclusion. The, uh, uh, Joseph Jacoparo and the people that saw it that night had come to their conclusion, even though they didn't see the whole thing, because as soon as the first shot was fired, they fled. Uh, May's story didn't fit. Uh, the, the, the two cops that came on the scene later didn't fit. But everybody had their conclusion, and they tried to prove their conclusion. And... Again, I just looked at all the evidence before I came to a conclusion. Yeah, and you see, that's and that's the thing too is that you know if somebody's actually skilled, even a, even in a amateur capacity, quote unquote, as an investigative journalist, you would be able to you know reason all of that out and and just you know look at the evidence and and, and figure that out as as much. And unfortunately, a lot of the alternative media instead 
Now, there are some good guys out there, Win. Those are the guys I usually pay attention to. But unfortunately, a lot of what I've been noticing is that I don't really hear that kind of analysis, that really good substantive stuff, uh, like how you just described. Um, in fact, what I've been noticing is a lot of sensationalistic garbage, again, like like I just mentioned and, uh, and, and you did as well regarding the Sandy Hook thing with, you know, supposed whatever, that's just basic, that I think is just conjecture. Uh, because, because it sounds sexy. It sounds, dare shall I say, glamorous even in a, in a certain perverted kind of context. Um, and really, I really just think it's a, it's, it's the worst aspects of the alternative media, that kind of, uh, uh, cheesy tabloidy aspect to it. And it very much is kind of a tabloid aspect when they do it. And, you know, there's been a term that I've picked up from other folks and, you know, I've kind of run with it, which is, you know, the carnival of distractions. And I'm sorry, I look at Sandy Hook, and the only thing I can think of is this carnival of distraction material. I have not heard a description of the events of Sandy Hook to the degree and the details necessary, like how you just did with Michael Hill, where you, you basically kind of slice and dice it, you know, rationally and whatnot. And, and also considering, too, what, what complicates the Sandy Hook thing which kind of, you know, really kind of gets back to uh, the line, the line in the sand concept, is the proposed gun bans at the federal level, with you know, Obama basically um, uh, saying that, he, well, I might, well, well, we'll either have Congress maybe do something, or maybe I'll just sign it in a, an executive order or something, and then of course, anybody who's, you know, a, a dissident or anyone who's got a, you know, a, their brain screwed on at least a little bit straight. Uh, starts to freak out because they because they understand a little bit about civ about uh, civilian disarmament and how a lot of times that can lead to democide, and so then they go into a frenzy of uh, firearms buying. But that's not how you're supposed to actually, you know, in a mature way, go about acquiring firearms. You're supposed to do it slowly over time, um, and then of course what that's created is this kind of stampeding herd effect, which is really the current firearms bubble that's going on right now, which kind of reminds me of the bubble that happened last year at about the same time of year as last December, which broke, and that one broke the records of the one that was the 2009 Obama gun scare. Uh, and so the art, and so the, the firearms prices are artificially inflated. Last time I checked, ARs have tripled in price. Um, and so, but, but the only reason for that happening, at least the claimed reason, and the alternative media is really pushing this right now, or perhaps just the carnival aspects of it, because that's what I think anyway, is just, uh, well, well, the government, it's, they're, they're going to they're gonna ban it, supposedly. They're going to ban it, so well, buy, 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 your, buy your stuff now. Buy your 30-round AR mags now before they go ban. You know, it, it's, it's this very much panicky, uh, fake atmosphere. It almost sounds like a used car salesman almost. Well, look at CNN uh, the day of the Newtown shooting. Uh, they came out with footage of children being led by a teacher with their eyes closed away from the building, and they also showed cops entering the building. And as near as I can tell, CNN presented that, indicating that this is probably live coverage. Now, um, Intel Hub uh, is the source that I saw. The Intel Hub, I think it is, is yeah, the source yeah, I, I saw this footage on. But um, they say that the same thing happened at St. Rose Preschool. <laughs> it was a active shooter uh, training exercise. And they imply in the article on the Intel Hub that it happened the same day. My guess is it happened long before then because I did a little research and I found out in Henderson, Nevada, in July of 2011, they had active shooter training in schools. So apparently this active shooter training has going on, been going on for a long time. But to show how the press plays into that, you go back three or four years, and whenever they use file footage you saw on the screen, file footage on the imagery that was put on television, they didn't put file footage on this uh St. Rose preschool exercise, but it was obviously an exercise because when the cops are going in, the cones are marking their entryway. There's traffic cones on the first tar uh, st parking stall in the walkway leading up to the building, and you can look at the aerial preschool and you can see the, the same nose on the curbing and the same walkway. Everything's exactly the same. The children are coming out and you can see one of the, the traffic cones back and back, and there were no traffic cones at 
uh, you know, there's, when there's an active shooter in real life, they're not going to go lay out traffic cones yeah. uh, like they did for this training exercise. I guess the cops are get dumb. Go between the cl- uh, cones when you go in the school. <laughs> But we have no idea when the St. Rose was, and, and they didn't indicate that. They implied that it was the same day as if, uh, well, that that leads us to conspiracy theory, uh, theory. They have the training down at this other preschool a couple miles away, and the event is in reality happening here at uh, uh, Sandy Hook Elementary. Mm. So they, uh, even though they were kind of half right in what they did, what they did is try and tie some things together that weren't quite necessarily true. I don't know if anybody looked into it or not, but uh, and they probably (laughs) don't. You know, here's another example. People are afraid to call the government and ask questions. But the detective that investigated Mike Hill's death, now, he hadn't come to conclusions. He just filed his reports. But I called him. He let me in. I called the Frasersburg Police Department uh, or went to the Frasersburg Police Department. Now, May was supposed to be on vacation. However, I saw him shut the door uh, down the hall. But the chief came out and said he's on vacation. So I couldn't talk to him. But you can talk to government people. Uh, But another instance where... I did my homework. It was called the Ma bombing. Um, I called uh, Mr. Brown. I think it's Ron Brown from the US, uh, Oklahoma Geological Survey or U.S. Geological Survey, I forgot which, and talked with him. And when I talked with him, I said, uh, you know, everybody's reporting that you said there were two bombings. And he said, I never said there were two bombings. I said there were two events. And I said, well, what's an event? He said, an event's an occurrence on the seismograph. And uh, so we talked about it, and he explained there's a surface and a subsurface uh, image. One goes in the bedrock and one goes on the surface. And the further it is away, the greater the distance between the time interval between these two events occurring. And he explained that the omniplex, less than a, a, uh, less than a mile from the Mara building, uh, didn't show two events because of the proximity. There would be the same, uh, the same time lapse based on the distance they overlap to a point that you couldn't distinguish the first from the second because it was so close. Mm -hmm. And so in talking with him, he said that everybody he sent the seismograph to, he also sent the omniplex seismograph to. Nobody published the omniplex uh, seismograph. Everybody showed the geological survey one that showed these two nearly identical events, which, as he explained, was one bomb. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, and I think those are the ones that have that made it into various documentaries um, uh, that that I've seen. And so, wow, you're saying there were actually more graphs than that, then? Well, if you go to my Oklahoma City bombing page, and I, I think it's what happened in Oklahoma City number three, but you'll see both the Omniplex and the uh, uh, the uh, geo, uh, geological survey seismographs. Oh wow! But yes, I mean, oh, I've got two pieces of evidence here. And if they ask questions, they, he, Brown would have explained why there's two events on the – and the, the interesting thing is there's kind of nine steps on the uh, event, which is the nine floors falling down. Um, but he's, he, he explained to everybody uh, what the events were, but people threw away the Omniplex one. They didn't publish it. I, you know, I don't know how many pages I've gone through in the last uh, – what is it? 18 years, 17 years, uh, and I have never seen the omniplex size graph shown on any page but my own. Nobody wants to talk about it. So here we've got two pieces of evidence. One fits the theory. The other one doesn't fit the theory. So they throw the one that doesn't fit the theory away, and now they've got a fact that supports the conclusion that they want that there were two bombs. Yeah, and actually I, you know... I mean, I remember when I was really getting started in the alternative media, I was mainly running off of what I'd seen in various docu- uh, you know, uh, uh, by v- in various documentaries. And obviously, yes, that, that phenomenon is unfortunately subject to because YouTube said so. And I should know because I was an amateur videographer for a while before I closed my YouTube channel down, so I kind of understand both sides of that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I remember watching I Love and Road to Tyranny and Terror Storm, both, both, both are AJ's films, 
and uh, you know, he apparently I think in one or both of them or something, there's footage of him uh, where he's actually in Oklahoma City, and he's like, you know, with the seismograph thing, and he's interviewing some random guy on the street or something, and it looked, and to me, and I didn't know any better. T- really at the time it looked legit to me and so it looked like wow okay so i guess that's what happened because he said so right one power of suggestion right hey hey to be perfectly honest i mean even despite my background and you know my education i mean i i guess you know it's possible for anyone to make a mistake and in this case i did uh i just i just didn't know any better it was just a lack of data at that point but it's it still showed i was giving a lot of credence to a source that i shouldn't have or a type of well, source too there's a lot of people that claim they're investigative reporters uh, in the Patriot community or, or researchers. One or the other investigative reporters basically covering news events, which was what we've been talking about. And there are researchers who look into, say, more historical things. Right. And uh, Randy was going to do a radio show once, and he had a, a proposed guest, uh, uh, Joyce Riley, and she was going to talk about U.S. Corporation, the corporation that everybody – talks about, you know, the government's corporation with the channel and all this stuff. But he wanted to find out if she was for real and everything, so he asked me if I would interview her with him, not on the radio, but to see if he wanted to do the show. And so we called and talked to her, and I prepared a uh, little document. Uh, you know, I did some research. <laughs> I got the 1871 Act, and I went to the U.S. Uh, there are two elements people used to support that. One is the uh, Congressional Act of 1871 creating the Washington, D.C., and the other one is a um, uh, U.S. Code, a, a statute that says the United uh, States is defined as a corporation. It lists about five or six things. And so when we were talking to Joyce, uh, she said she was a researcher, and she just the research, and I said, do you have a copy? I was going to point out some things to her in the 1871 Act. And I said, you have a copy of the act? I said, no. She, uh, I, she, I said, you said you're a researcher. Uh, you don't have a copy of the act, the source document for what you're talking about. And she kind of hemmed and hawed, well, I've got the parts that I need and all this. Oh, no. And then I said, well, have you uh, really researched this? And she said, yes, I have. And I said, well, and you don't have the, the entire act of 1871? She said, well, I don't need it. I read what other people do. I, that's my research. I read what other people no. write, and then I write it in my own words. Well, needless to say, Randy did not have her on the show. Oh, no, you're kidding. But that, the, there's a researcher. She claims to be a researcher. Now, how many people in the Patriot community claim, honestly claim to be researchers or investigative reporters? Yeah. I mean, hey, I mean, I know I do those uh, book reports on my blog, but I, at least I make it a point that I'm looking at the content of this particular book. I try to do it in a vacuum as much as possible, hey. although every every once in a while I'll draw inferences or, or compare stuff. But I don't make a claim that I'm a researcher when I'm doing those book reviews. So I see the no. distinction that you're making with uh, Joyce, about Joyce Riley. Yeah, but see, you're not claiming to be a researcher or an investigative reporter. You're doing a review of a book book and it's a subjective review done by sleepy salsa right. of a book written by Joe smith hey that you admit what it is yeah you might be wrong you disagree with him you might be right wrong if you agree with him right. uh you might be right in either case as well but that's uh totally different that's a a rather subjective analysis of something if you're reporting news or reporting uh something of historical nature uh there should be an obligation to present it well researched or well investigated, either one. You're talking about original material. Well, in research, yes, original material. In investigation, going out and talking to people that are players in the game. Yeah. And so, and so, you yes. can talk. A lot of these investigative reporters have read these books by so and so. You know, and some of these books even say I'm a lawyer. You know, they say I'm a lawyer. I think three or four books, published books, say that Gary Hunt's a lawyer from Florida. I've never been a lawyer. I was a pre-law student, but then I gave that up for surveying. Um, I'm not a lawyer, never have been, never would be. I wouldn't want to. In fact, I'm glad I changed my direction. <laughs> yeah, Except I just. I, I changed uh, my pursuit in life. Right. 
I mean, it's to me, it's it's rather offensive to call me a lawyer. <laughs> well, there's the Shakespeare line, obviously, about lawyers, but um, yeah, I, 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 um, I mean, I mean, even during my college years, uh, and yes, yeah, some colleges will accept homeschoolers, obviously. Well, let uh, me finish no. the point on that. Sure, sure, please. I have never been hard to find. When I took uh, my my daughter's first birthday, I took. Two weeks off, went to Connecticut. We went up to Massachusetts, went Battle Road, and went up to New Hampshire. And we spent a couple of weeks together. And when I got back to South Bend, this is how easy I am to find. There were 17 messages asking me to go to uh, Oklahoma City. Glenn Wilburn, J.D. Cash, uh, uh, Richard Reyna from Jones' defense team, um, Bill Jasper, uh, and I forgot the others. Uh, oh, Media Bypass Magazine wanted to talk to me about it because of some stuff. And right. uh, so I was not hard to find. I never have been. You know, when I put out my fax releases back in the 90s, they always had where I was when the fax release went out. In fact, I was just reading one today that I posted on the blog today. Uh, if if you look at the original, I was in... in uh, on Peoria Avenue, the street address, the phone number where I was staying in uh, in Arizona, Phoenix. And, and so I was never hard to find. Whenever I put a fax out, I gave a return number where I could be reached. Um, so I've never been hard to find. But these people write these books, and they accuse me of being a government agent. Well, you know what happened when we did the PU, uh, the uh, John Doe 4 radio show w- with Randy. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, all these claims, but then nobody tried to find out if I was really there or not, and I think that after the show was completed, it was pretty well understood that I, unless I had a transporter, I couldn't have been in Oklahoma City and uh, downtown Orlando at the Huey Building at the same time. Right, right. It's 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 not feasible, yeah. And yeah, and it's kind of interesting, too. They, and it, but sorry. they researched this John Doe 4 thing, and Bill Cooper said it, so it must be true, and then I found it on 40,000 web pages saying Gary Hunt's John Doe 4. So that's good. I've done my research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah, obviously that was completely untrue as, as we did on that episode. But yeah, I, uh, but even during my college years when I would write, you know, research or term papers for my professors, I mean, uh, every, you know, everyone in my class now, now they may have forgotten since then, of course, but at least I remember that there's a difference between like, you know, primary sources and secondary sources and tertiary sources, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're trying to do something as original, whatever you're working on is, is as original as possible. You want to keep as close to primary sources as possible. And so, and especially much more so if you're doing an investigative journalist type thing, you know, you want to be talking to witnesses, you know, people that were there or people who observed something or did something, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Not, uh, you know, not, not basing it off rumor that someone else said, I mean, that, that doesn't count as evidence, not even, it well, doesn't all, even count as an affidavit or anything like that. It, in all fairness, in Oklahoma City, uh, sometimes uh, even primary witnesses uh, don't have everything together. Well, we saw what happened with Brown and other people, but uh, there were at least two recordings of two the sound of two explosions short distance apart. Mm-hmm. One was... Uh, uh, recording a meeting that was going on somewhere and I forgot what the other one was. So that you've got two instances and they said there were two explosions. I heard them both, but what could that possibly be? And now here, here's where you have to come in with, what do they call it? Critical thinking. Are there any <laughs> other possibilities? Well, if, if I blow a bunch of air into a building with a percussive bomb, uh, an air blast like a NFO or the, uh, uh, ammonium nitrate, uh, Expl- uh, which we found out later it was, all this air goes into this confined space. And then yeah. it comes back out. And then we start having thud, 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 the building fall ac- uh, apart. But the two loud sounds are caused by vibration in the air. One is the initial explosion, and the second one is this air that is jammed in at uh, a phenomenal velocity. And then now it has to come back out of the building. And that would create another boom. So I believe the recordings are the explosion and the return of that air coming back out of the building. Yeah, and it's funny you should mention that, too, because that reminds me of several conversations I've had over the past. Wait, days. I said I believe that, but it is a possibility that if I heard two explosions, uh, one of them could have been that other one. I wasn't there, and I can't say for sure. 
so I'm trying to be objective about it. I believe that the second sound was the air coming back out because it has to come back out and it's going to have comparable, a little lesser, but comparable velocity, uh, nearly comparable velocity to the initial explosion, which is the sound itself. Gary, how dare you be intellectually honest? <laughs> I mean, look, um, I remember, you know, conversations I've had with uh, folks, especially over the past decade, well well before I got involved with the alter alternative media in any capacity, and I remember there were folks just coming out of the woodwork through the alternative media at that time um, that uh, I, and I, I remember thinking to myself, wow, I never knew there were so many quote-unquote engineers that, that, that knew oh so much, of course, about controlled demolition. They just came out of the woodwork. I was kind of surprised, like, where were they before? And, of course, it then turned out later they really aren't engineers. They were just people thinking that they knew anything about physics or, or chemistry or anything like that. And so they claimed, made all sorts of claims about controlled demolition. I mean, I remember stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, I just, um, <laughs> you know, it's it's awful, too. Like, any of these events, it's it's like there's no concept of of really objective analysis and quite frankly it, it makes a mockery of um it really makes the alternative media look bad because you know the alternative media the whole point of it was to get around the corporate whore mainstream media which is basically controlled by the establishment and pretty much more or less in a lot of respects by the government in a lot of ways so and falling into the same trap though the objective is probably different because if we look at cnn not saying file footage there seems to be intending to achieve, achieve a false presentation where the patriot community is trying to create a conclusion that meets their preconceived conception of the event. So yeah. there's a slight difference between the two. But yes, it's very deceptive to do that and, and to make claims that they are. I mean, I'd like to see somebody... Pro let me say, prove their credentials by showing a history of investigative reporting or research, historical. Or, yeah, something, think, something something like, along those lines, yeah. I, I think you've seen enough of both types of work of mine, the historical, mm -hmm. as well as the investigative reporting that is substantiated. I, uh, who I talked to, what they, they determined, or uh, what they told me, uh, uh, my kills case, pictures the gun, pictures of the autopsy, uh, I do my homework, uh, somebody else, all these people that lay this claim, I have yet to see one that can demonstrate that they have properly done an investigation or properly done the research they talk about. Mm -hmm. Just read one today that came to me. It was rather interesting. It talks about a the Miller decision in 1939 and John Bad Elk, but he did not give sites. He didn't give the U.S. Supreme Court site for it. He just gave the years. No. Uh, well, you know, he, he's not even giving you enough information to make it easy to track down. You know, if I give uh, oh, John Bad Elk. You're supposed to cite your sources, though. That's just not playing fair. Well, it's not. Whether he's read them or not, I don't know. But it's just like with Joyce Riley, you know, do you have the Act of 1871? Uh, yeah. Well, I've got it on my computer. Anybody want a copy? I'll be glad to send it to them. So yeah, uh, it's yeah, and and unfortunately, you know, because of the the behavior on the alternative media side, it's they've I've really unfortunately in my life, especially these past couple of years, especially uh, at least that I've noticed, um, they've they've really been pandering with the since, and there really isn't a better term that I can think of other than that's kind of sensationalistic garbage. But wait a minute, I thought the corporate horror, I thought. Americans were sick, at least those who were dissidents or otherwise not the mainline public in, in one shape or form, were disgusted with the corporate horror media for many reasons, but one of, a, one of those kind of recurring reasons was because of sensationalistic garbage. But now I'm seeing it on the alternative media side, which is, nah, that's not good. And so really, you know, it, it, becomes, it becomes a carnival of, of distractions. And so, and then that, you know, obfuscates the good work that the alternative media does. And so, uh, you know, that needs to stop or at least be mitigated or something. But unfortunately... Let's it's... go a little further than obfuscates. Let's look at who it serves. Yeah. Somebody's private... Who does it serve? 
I don't know, somebody's private agenda or glamorizing. Well, uh, if it creates division in the community because people listen to this and want to believe it, and somebody listens to that and wants to believe it, and somebody else listens to that and wants to believe it, it's created division. That's the most effective tool the government has is creating division. So these people, whether knowingly or just out of their whatever motivates them to pursue these false leads and try and give credence to them, they end up serving the government intentionally or unintentionally. They serve the government by creating this division, don't they? Yeah, they do, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether they're controlled opposition or useful idiots. It's it, The result is the same. And I would also say, you know, it, you know, more in a recent sense with, with Sandy Hook, I, I've, I've pretty much kind of heard different versions, and I I could study more of it if I want to. I just don't think it's ultimately important because the result is the same with the Hegelian dialectic. I mean, the establishment is trying to push for gun control, more gun control to some degree, I guess, maybe. But even if they did, and even that's kind of debatable, but even if they did, I don't really see that necessarily as a problem. In fact, I would prefer to see it as a good thing in in one sense. Think about it. If the government basically, if it is true what some alternative media people are saying that oh, the gun ban's going to go into effect or a magazine restriction or whatever version it happens to be, why don't we use that, and, and let's assume it does happen, why don't we just use that as a recruiting tool and then we get we re, and we help move people, move help move them on down the line? So any which way it plays, as long as we have the proper mindset about it, I think we kind of win either way, <laughs> in a manner of speaking. So I don't personally worry about it other than... That firearms bubble, but even that, I'm not, you know, it's just I just wait until the bubble pops and prices stabilize. So even that's kind of fixable already because I understand economics. So in the overall aggregate, I, I don't wonder why some of the truthers or other types of guys in the alternative media are still like obsessing and still talking about Sandy Hook. It's it's it kind of it's getting a little creepy even for me, Gary. Well, I mean, you can prove anything you want. All you have to do is pick which CNN news feeds you've got and which, uh, you know, there's a page that shows that all these people are the same people and that they're actors. And then there's the one that says nobody died. And then there's uh, no close, open coffin, which I guess supports that. But then where well, those kids go flying saucers or something? But, you know, we pick and choose. Yes, put it together and you will serve the enemy more than you will serve the patriot community. Right, right. And so, I, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, it's just, you know, depending on what the establishment eventually ends up doing, you know, what what is that line in the sand? Not just, you know, for this particular specific, you know, possible weapon span, but I mean, like in an overall sense, I mean, what things should not be tolerated? I mean, which is the point at which, uh, you know, it's time to, you know, have a good old home down and... Uh, you know, get physical, so to speak. I mean, well, what if what if we came up with a credible news source for the Patriot community? Hell, that would be an improvement. <laughs> well, I think you came up with a, an idea that was, uh, let me say, in error about a year ago. Sure, yeah. And it got modified uh, to brought, bring it into something that I've thought about for a long time, which is establishing a, a credible source for news and even research information uh, and for the Patriot community so that the reliability factor would be based on the source. It would be the Intel Hub. Um, you know, if if I had done the Intel Hub story, I would have called St. Rose Preschool and asked them what day they had when they had that active shooter drill to be able to assign something to that picture to prove that uh, CNN uh, – falsely and, and perhaps maliciously uh, presented it on that day to make it appear that something had occurred down the street the same time this event was occurring at Sandy Hook. Um, so, you know, we're going to, so, sooner or later, the uh, Committee for Digital Correspondence is the name that we've developed for it. Uh, it's on committee.org now, and there was a true story put out there, a five-part series uh, done by Amelia Foxwell. She did an excellent job on it, interviewing a lady who happened to run into Charles Dyer in a campground in Texas. 
Uh, the information was verified. Uh, it's a true story. Uh, it hasn't gotten a lot of attention in the Patriot Press. Perhaps it should. Yeah, I, Maybe they should see what can be done. Yeah, and it's funny you should bring that up. I have read that, and I have not really seen much coverage of that or, frankly, a lot, you know, really anything with, uh, you know, that, that particular, you know, saga. And, you know, it's, I don't know, I, I almost feel like certain things are being ignored by the alternative media when they shouldn't. I mean, let's take something really simple like committees of safety or any one of a handful of things. I mean, I remember, Gary, about six, seven years ago or so, I remember, you know, AJ, for example, being really hyped up on a militia and you need to go start a militia. Okay, well, and then he modified it to, okay, don't join a, don't call it a militia, but it's still a militia. And now we fast forward to now, and even some of the other, you know, Patriot rock stars I, I, I still listen to who aren't as bad, but it, it kind of gives me an idea about how they're, uh, well, for lack of a better term, they're spinning things. Even some of them are saying, wow, AJ's really gone off the deep end even more so than he kind of somewhat would already, because now he's saying the militia is bad. And it, and I went and I double checked and yeah the you know, according to him the militia is bad now which is kind of weird because I you know I was you know that's my point though is that uh, I don't know I, I feel that the alternative media is distracting people with a lot of stuff that at least a good portion of it they're distracting people with this carnival you know it's this carnival atmosphere on all this crap that doesn't matter it doesn't matter today and even less tomorrow and instead of actually and instead of actually helping teach and instruct people in what they need to know and the skills they need to know in order to secure their liberties, um, which I think, and, and there, don't get me wrong, there have been some attempts to do that with like certain, I don't know, tutorials or whatever, but generally speaking, it's not like the main thrust. Um, in fact, I remember, th uh, <laughs> I know this can be a kind of a touchy subject, but I, uh, I had my as much as I like the guy, I kind of had my own doubts about Ron Paul, and we all saw how that turned out. I mean, think of it this way: the the all those donations. What was it? I mean, this past electoral cycle was like what forty million dollars or something. It was a lot of money. So imagine yeah. if instead of forty million dollars for one single presidential campaign that completely flopped, and it's and by the way, I mean, I remember when Adam Kokesh was actually trying to get his get a refund actually, which is funny because Kokesh got his start which is funny because Kokesh got his uh, start in the alternative media because he gave a speech at a Ron Paul rally. But that's a, that's that's I'll say that for another time obviously. Um, but what I thought was interesting was that sounds rather hypocritical. I think. Uh, I th I think he. Let me put it well. In def in Kokesh's defense, what I'll say is that I think he's maturing, and I'll leave it at that. But well, that could be. But his uh, it was hypocritical to ask for his money back because uh, education costs money, and if he learned something from it, he should have realized <laughs> that that contribution was tuition, and he had no right to ask for it back. Touche. He gave it voluntarily. Touche. Touche. Um. But you, now is he is he collecting money on false pretexts now? <laughs> uh, for example, uh, he did everything he could to get arrested at what was it the Lincoln Memorial? Jefferson Jefferson yeah Jefferson Memorial yeah. did everything he could to do, do to get arrested so that he could raise funds for it. Uh, but he didn't say that he was doing everything he could to get arrested. So that was a false pretense <laughs> on his part, which was uh, more divisive than Ron Paul's honestly trying to uh, seek the nomination. For uh, for president of the United States. Well, so yeah. If, if we look at it from Kokish's side, well, everybody that made contributions based on his getting arrested at the Jefferson Memorial should ask for their money back. <laughs> that's that's an interesting explanation. I haven't quite heard that one. Um, what I will say is that that forty million dollars. Imagine what else that could have been applied to. I mean, that could have been. Uh, that could have been training uh, or in-person, you know, field training and equipment for militia. That could have been uh, office equipment and, I don't know, messaging, cryptography it, type. It could have. But now think of the education that we got out of that, too, that the fact that the Republican Party will control, they will change the rules in the middle of a convention. They will do whatever they have to to exclude anybody that isn't their hand-picked nominee for president of the United States. So it was an expensive education, $40 million. It was a lot to learn that. Some of us knew that existed before then. I mean, I've written about uh, politics a few times. And uh, I know that if you, you haven't kissed the ass of those in power in the party, and most of their names are never known, 
that you ain't going to go nowhere. You will never get party support. They control the whatever they call that local uh, committee in big cities, and, and they, they control the whole thing, and you ain't going to get in. And look at all the footage that came out of the conventions where, uh, one, they voted out the, the chairman and voted in a new chairman, and the old chairman then called the police to kick out the new chairman and arrest him so that they could go on with the convention under the changed rules that the party had used to exclude uh, the Ron Paul supporters. Yeah, and, uh, and you remember when— I think in Phoenix, uh, in Phoenix they were, weren't allowing— the the elected delegates in the convention unless they agreed to support Romney. Yeah, and obviously there are uh, many problems with the whole Ron Paul effort, but I really want to point to that one about that. Well, you know, my all, point, though, sure. is it was more expensive. It was an education in the reality of the two-party system. Right, right, right. And and you can't even uh, – you can't infiltrate – uh, the the government in order to turn around on itself as it is now and and like limited or whatever at least not so that way. Look at how many people are realizing that the Democrats and the Republicans ain't all that much difference. So that forty million dollars, but I would say at least forty million people have begun to question the two party system that we have instituted and they have cemented their control of in this country. I would even go to the next step and, and, and say that even for people who understand the left-right paradigm and how fakey it is, you still can't have your anti-establishment candidate, which is why Ron Paul was billed as, uh, you know, infiltrate one of the f supposed factions, in this case the Republican Party, you know, infiltrate it, you know, get, you know seize power, kind of like a, like a, like a quasi-peaceful coup d'etat. It's kind of how it was billed to, to those of us who kind of had an idea of what was going on. And, and and then he'll mystically, you know, send, get the troops back and solve everything with a flick of his pen, basically. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, any which way you slice it, and obviously that would be a discussion for other time because there's many details with that. But yeah, exactly. It, you're right. It is a very expensive education. Um, and actually, that But a of, necessary one. I mean, you know, how, how else could that two-party control of the entire process have been made public to the extent that it was? Uh, perhaps an advertising com campaign, but that's just words. But here, in reality, it was demonstrated over and over and over again. Right, right. And actually, you mentioned Kokesh a, a moment ago about getting arrested. You know, I remember when he did that, that was, that was billed as an act of civil disobedience to basically demonstrate how awful the establishment is. And that kind of reminded me of what pretty much for the most part, what the Free State Project, you know, the, the Free Staters, those uh, libertarians, the whole idea of libertarians move to New Hampshire and try and make the place freer somehow. And they, those guys over the years have been basically trying to grab media attention by getting arrested for doing things like, you know, smoking hemp in, uh, in a, at a park or something. And so it's almost... But as that's if, sensationalism for the purpose of raising funds. It's, decept it's deceptive. Right, and so in so in a sense, Kokesh, you know, is obviously not unique. He was just following what is now the mainline libertarian uh, practice of blatantly committing an act of civil disobedience uh, in 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 with 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 how you described it. And I gotta say, you know, I understand Thoreau. I even wrote you know an article going through his his infamous essay on the duty of civil disobedience. I really don't see him uh, justifying this twist on it, I, I guess is the nice way to put it. <laughs> well, that's it. Uh, back in the, let's go back to the 60s again, the anti-war demonstrations. I was arrested once uh, at a demonstration, and I didn't like it. Uh, you know, I was going to have to, say, well, of course, we didn't have the Internet, and you, there was no way to, to have a defense fund, which reminds me of uh, Luke Grudkowski as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, have defense funds. You, 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 hundreds of people get arrested. Each one's on his own. He's got to come up with his own bail money, and then he's got to defend himself or get the char uh, hope the charges get dropped. But there were many number of times that we were willing to get arrested, and fortunately it was just the one in Santa Cruz where I got arrested. Uh, but the commitment was there. We knew we could get arrested, and we knew that our uh, then we were in our own hands. We didn't have 
uh, salvation in, in financial contributions that actually become profitable at a certain point. And again, I'm thinking of Luke Rudkowski where the charges were dropped. Uh, I think the common law court had that unanswered indictment. The charges were dropped and he raised thousands of dollars in that campaign, something like that. I don't yeah, recall. It was, it was, yeah, it was the uh, BS versus Rudkowski unanswered indictment. Yeah. yeah, I remember reading that. And yeah, it's. So, so yeah. these guys now do it. Uh, as a form of sensationalism, not a form of commitment. So there's uh, a significant difference when your motive. How pure is his motivation in getting arrested? Let me put it that way: is it is his objective to raise money and actually profit by the arrest, or is it a commitment that is going to take from him without recourse to uh, have have that uh, expense in both time and and. Uh, uh, economic or financial expense uh, to be a burden on him, you know is is, right. is he is he really following the concept of uh, civil disobedience, civil disobedience uh, in the proper context, or is it become a a, a tool of uh, selling newspapers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, it's uh, you know there was a documentary I watched about a month or so ago. Uh, came as a recommendation. I, I listened to the guy describe what it was about, and I said, okay, fine, I'll take a look at it. And it was actually enlightening in a couple of ways, but not, I don't mean this in a positive sense, and here's why. It was entitled Derek J's Victim List Crime Spree. And it was a documentary that basically followed who apparently is now, I, he's not really a Patriot rock star, but he, he's, he's like a wannabe, I guess. Uh, he's more in the libertarian circles, not what you would normally think was the patriot community. Uh, but, you know, Derek J. Um, and he is a, he was a free stater for a while. And basically the film basically documents his arrival as a free stater in New Hampshire and shows him kind of getting along and, and, and you know, uh, being doing all the, you know, libertarian activist stuff. And then it also shows the different actions they went to, like combination of street protests, uh, you know, local radio stuff he's hosted, uh, different civil disobedience things like smoking cannabis in a park, for example. And also a lot of it is because the part of the joke in the, kind of in the title about victimless crimes, it's victimless crime spree. So a lot of it is obviously him getting arrested. Uh, now, they didn't mention this in the film. I'm mentioning this more just, just as kind of his background. But there was always a joke I, I was aware of ever since FSP started that if one – I'm going to get this right – if one third of the free staters are not in prison at any one time, they're doing something wrong because <laughs> because because they were because they were there was such a turnover. There were so many getting so, get, there were so many of them getting arrested as frequently as they were that approximately one third of all known free staters were constantly in prison. But it was kind of rotating out. In fact, in that film, they actually mentioned, and I'm not going to get the term exactly right, but it's but it's immaterial. They actually called, I think it was the prison, it's like some sort of smaller prison, I think it's in Keene. Uh, like, they called it the, the Keene Spiritual Retreat. That's what they called the, one of the local prisons. Because so many of them had gotten in there, yeah. And, and basically, long story short, you, you basically go to the end of the film, and, Der and Derek J, because, and there are also some scenes where he's in the courtroom and the judge is being all... I think the judge was being tyrannical. That's my personal opinion. But the point is that at one point, there's a scene toward the end where Derek J is, is looking at all of these pieces of paper uh, that are basically charges against him where he's been sentenced or he's about to be sentenced or something, something like that. And at one point, he had a choice, and he's narrating, and you hear him. He basically says that, I had a choice. Basically, I was looking at, what was it? It was like 20 years in prison for, it was like consecutive sentences. It was, it was really a lot of stuff. He did. He racked it up pretty quickly, actually. Well, um, it's, it's safe now back in the 60s and 70s. Most states had 5 to 25 for mere possession. Hmm. I got busted in Pittsburgh, and I, I ended up with two years of probation. And the, as the judge said, you're a Vietnam veteran, so I'm going to give you two years uh, on probation. And uh, I got busted in Florida. I ended up beating that on illegal search. But I think I was facing five years in prison in Florida. So it was not a toy to play with back then because there were people in the South that were serving 25 years for mere possession. Nowadays, most marijuana possession ends up in probation 
and usually relatively short term. So I will say it's a lot safer to go to demonstrations now and to do such things. Back then in the 60s, too, there were many demonstrations. If you look, go back and look at some of the file footage on that, there, were, uh, there was one in Santa Cruz, not the one I got arrested at, but uh, a nurse was going home from the hospital, and she happened to get caught up in the people running from the police. And she was beaten bloody on the side of the road. Uh, blood flowed in the streets in the 60s in the anti-war demonstrations. Uh, I have yet to see blood flow, even close to what most of the demonstrations resulted in back then, uh, in these OWS and any of these other demonstrations. They get tear gassed and they get upset. Uh, the moratorium in Washington in 1969 uh, I was up on the, the mall then, and uh, an intersection below us, the cops came in from three sides, pushing people from these streets into the intersection, and then started throwing tear ga gas on the road that came up to the mall to keep them from going to the mall, and then kept pressing on them, beating them. And there was blood flowing, and people were, uh, were breathing tear gas, high concentrations of it for five or ten minutes, and we went down to a wall and tried to pull people up that tried to get out through a parking lot. There was no escape. I mean, they were brutal back then compared to now. They didn't have the big shields. They didn't have the face masks. They weren't equipped like they are now. But the commitment back then had consequences much more severe, whether it be possession of marijuana, you know, prison time, right. or being beat to a pulp. And people were being beat to a pulp. Many pictures of... Uh, people with ju blood just almost gushing out of their head. Uh, from And they beat them on the head back then, too. Now they beat them on the side so it doesn't show so much. Yeah, yeah. Well, so when you get to civil it, 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 disobedience, it's become an art form now as opposed to a commitment that was required back then. And yeah. so, you know, like I've said many times, until people start carrying pitchforks, and at least there's <laughs> a threat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're carrying signs. <laughs> it's almost a joke. It's an inconvenience. It, it, no, it, no, it is a joke, and that, that's why I don't feel any. You know, I don't feel uh, hesitant in saying sign waving cowards because that's what it is. Um, yes, but it does sell newspapers and we get it in uh, defense fund contributions. Right, so it's right. Deal, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. And so, sorry. Before I forget, so in that last, so in that one of those last scenes of that documentary, so he was looking at like all these consecutive sentences. But in order to avoid that, uh, if he took a plea agreement, then I think he was going to get like what, like what, two months or three months? It was really, it was rel relatively speaking, or comparatively, it was way shorter. And he would get, I think, like two or three years probation or something to that effect. And obviously, he took the plea agreement. And, and then they show him walking into the jail and they. Then they show another scene where he's actually in the jail on a on a teleconferencing video phone or whatever, and then later they show the big welcome. You know, all these all the other free staters outside the jail when he walks out, everyone's hugging him, and then apparently he actually leaves New Hampshire because there were some complications or or, or something to that effect. But the point is that yeah, he uh, he took a plea agreement, which of course kind of raises other questions. Obviously, that uh, and I, I, he dropped he dropped his principles on the Free State Project too, didn't he, by leaving. New Hampshire. Well, there were there were other complications. I don't I don't exactly remember, but what really well, stuck that... in my mind what what really stuck in my mind was uh, was the plea agreement thing because obviously when you're doing when you're playing uh, when you're dancing the two, the tango two step with the secret police, the last thing you want anyone involved on your side is some sort of a plea agreement on their end. <laughs> and uh, you know that's I don't know. I I partially feel sorry for the guy, but on the other hand. I don't think he really was careful about what activities he was going to engage in, and at the end of the day, it kind of, you know kind of has to beg the question: What did he actually accomplish? And I can't well, find anything. Getting back to the original subject, the sand has gotten a lot softer in the last twenty, thirty years, hasn't it? Yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of what I was kind of alluding to. Yeah. Um, so uh, the commitment. Of to civil disobedience or the commitment to the patriot cause, uh, the line on the sand uh, has become mushy. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I mean, yeah. Mushy, I mean, soupy, something. Yeah, I don't know what the right. Well, I mean, I mean, like for example, if, well, I mean, like for example, I mean, if I say resist tyrants, I'm thinking more, you know, either preparatory stuff for guerrilla warfare or an offshoot of that, or actual guerrilla warfare, uh, you know, or you know, this so the actual either you know warfare itself or uh, a support function of some kind. When I've heard other people talk about resisting tyranny, they what they really mean, and in their actions, because actions speak louder than words, like my mom said, I taught us when I taught me when I was young, uh, is is. Like what? Filing paperwork, waving signs, and yacking people's ear off, you know, when, on, on a public street corner. Well, you're they don't forgetting want to one, the bra- the bravado. Don't forget the bravado. And the bravado. Thank you. Yes, I. And, and I don't know, Gary. I just at the end of the day, I just again, it's my reaction to Sandy Hook as the as the most recent example I can think of. I just don't. I just don't get hyped up about these things like I know some of the other guys in the alternative media do, and I've told them, please don't get hyped up. It's not worth the energy. Instead, I would I'd suggest instead here are some other areas you can focus in. But most of them don't listen to me. They don't take my advice, and they like getting hyped up. You know that sensationalistic. Ooh, something in the air is stirring when it's not something of substance that's stirring. I well, mean, let's look at a good research project, shall we? Yeah, sure. Um, now, now, we're going to focus the research strictly on what's available on the Internet. Mm-hmm. But we're going to take some media rock stars, uh, patriot rock stars, I think. Is that the term you use, patriot rock stars? It was, it was actually Randy who coined the term, but yeah, patriot rock okay. stars, yes. Okay. Um, the divas. Gonna, take some radio, patriot rock stars and go back and search the Internet. I mean, you, this is an extensive job. I mean, some of these guys probably have many thousands of pages, but go back and, and date what the, uh, their, their bravado claims and, and show the timeline, the history of their bravado claims, and maybe put a YouTube together on it and show that this line, how many times this line has slid. Oh, wow. That's an excellent project idea. In fact, for one particular but project... Qualify it. Make sure that you identify in your final results that you have searched only the internet. Show how many pages re- you've researched as well. I mean, be honest about your research. Wow, that is an excellent idea. I might need to pass that along to somebody. <laughs> yeah, you don't have time now with all that we've got going on, but uh, yeah, that would uh, that would prove that somebody was a real researcher. In fact, uh, now I... you have to go back to where that person said it. You can't go to where somebody said he said it. You have to go back to where he said it. Right, the original source material. In yeah, fact. They... Exactly what he said, the context, everything. In fact, since you mentioned that wonderful project idea, if somebody wanted to, uh, God, let me think for a minute. It was, I remember when Alex Jones, this was roughly, it was late 1999, so it was the Y2K scare, and I remember that when I was a kid. Um, I remember he was making claims, and there are old broadcasts of this. They might be up on YouTube. I think that might be the only place available left because I think they were removed from his original archives or something. But he was claiming it was something – I'm kind of going off my memory here. Something about Russians invading when the computers get shot off or something. It was something really strange. Yeah, and, anything that where he's giving a timeline on it qualifies as I think as he pro- did. Oh. I think he did actually. Um, well, I think you can go back to uh, Glenn Beck and, and Rush Limbaugh as well. <laughs> Rush Limbaugh, you can go back, what, 30 years? I, I guess, he, when did he start? Back in the 80s, right? Yeah. You can go all the way back, and, and he, he has predicted things. Now, you know, I think Rush is a tool of the, the Republican Party, but oh, he's yeah. still got a, a, a substantial following in the Patriot community. Mm-hmm. And uh, he tells, uh, Glenn he Beck, tell, obviously. He tells them what they want to hear. I mean... That's exactly it. And if he wants, uh, if he's predicting uh, uh, that this is going to happen by then, that comes the bravado. Uh, well, okay, well, not we... quite the same as the. I'm going to give him one bullet at a time, but uh, it's hypocrisy. Okay, well, here's probably the point only question and, then. And then, then when you when you do it, you have to also, in all fairness to the the subject of the the research, is if he came out and said. By Christmas, this is going to happen, and he comes in out after Christmas and says, I, I was wrong. That negates that one. You can include it, but show his integrity in admitting he was wrong. Okay. Well, I'll definitely pass that on to someone, uh, obviously. But here's probably the Panoiman question that's been bugging me forever. Is the line in the sand a real thing? And if so, 
where what rough gauge should be used to actually draw it or is it just an unanswerable question well i would suggest long beach either new york or california <laughs> long beach to draw the line in the sand in this in the context that is used uh, by most people now now i wrote an article back in the 90s called the line is drawn and it had to do with uh, the exclusionary rule hr 666 uh and I was talking about if this passed, this passed, this should be a line in the sand because they were going to say that the uh, – I don't know if it's passed or not. I don't recall. But uh, basically the exclusionary rule, they were going to say that uh, if if the evidence was obtained illegally, as long as they could come up with some rationalization for the illegal obtaining of evidence, that they could use it in court. Now, that destroys the justice system. Well, the justice system. Uh, process in this country has been destroyed any number of ways but the talk back then and especially with this uh 666 being the house resolution number uh everybody thought this should be it because of the 666 the evil but i have to say i fell into that i said if this passes that should be the line the, the that should be where we draw the line if this passes we should act um, I believed we should act. Now, people have accused me of, well, you haven't acted. Well, no, <laughs> I'm not dumb enough to take it on alone, but I'm trying to move people along that not-so-thin line right. uh, as rapidly as I can. But, I, you know, people accuse me, oh, you're not in the militia. You can't talk about militia. Oh, shit, I can't talk about the Constitution because I'm not in the militia. Okay, but, you know, at, at 66 years old, I'm probably a little too old to go humping out in the woods. <laughs> paintball yeah and i can definitely because because even yeah. for me it's it's it can be challenging so yeah i can only imagine but, but then i take another posture too i mean after wake oh people like my writing so much they encouraged me to take up writing so did it cost me anything well i gave up a business of 16 years i was making eighty five thousand dollars a year or more clearer and i walked away from that so you know i've made a commitment to what i do um my commitment, though, if I can write, then I should be in Philadelphia, not at Bunker Hill. Right. And that's where people had asked me to go, to Philadelphia, not to Bunker Hill. And I will remain in Philadelphia uh, trying to use the pen instead of the sword as much as I possibly can. That seems to suit my abilities far better than uh, my military training. I went through basic training, and then I learned how to keep airplanes in the air, and I learned how to look at aerial photographs. Uh, but those that are trained in infantry or artillery or uh, in any of the, the combat arts, uh, they have no excuse unless they are good writers. And when, Good writers, let's get back to researchers and investigative reporters. Uh, if they're good writers, perhaps they should consider that the pen can be more powerful than the sword. But if their bravado is there and they've drawn that line in the sand, damn it, you drew the line. I mean, <laughs> Uh, well, okay, well then, would I be incorrect in saying then that the line in the sand is a myth? In the context that I've seen it for the last 20 years, I would say, yes, it is uh, nearly mythical. I think there are some people... Uh, some friends of mine, George Sibley and Linda Lyon, they were executed by the state of Alabama because they drew a line in the sand. Um, they killed a cop and they died. Gordon Call, he drew a line in the sand, he died. Um, the Davidians drew a line in the sand. <laughs> yeah, we all know what happened to them, yeah. Right. But they were they made the commitment. They got the children, or some of the, many of the children out, uh, you know, the list I read was the ones that uh, were inside at the time. Um, I think there's other cases where people have made a commitment and they've stood by it. But the percentage is so small, it's unbelievable. Um, I know I was faced with the cops breaking, breaking down, kicking in my office door, coming in with their nine millimeters pointed at my head. And I had a, uh, a nine millimeter 380 about six inches from my hand on my desk and a, a loaded AK-47 about a foot and a half to the left of me. But uh, discretion can be the better part of valor. I did not 
defend myself, and I knew I was getting arrested for failure to appear, and I didn't think that was a cause worth dying for. But uh, I don't believe that I've made any commitments anywhere along the line uh, where I said I would do something, uh, drawn a line in the sand when they cross this, I'm going to pick up my rifle. Yeah. Um, but those that say that, uh, that are foolish enough to say it and not mean it, um, you know, I, I I don't really know what to call them. In yeah. Because, well, I mean, and here's the other problem too: is that I mean, from describing them any further than that. Right. Right. And see, the other problem too is that even if you know that kind of classical understanding of what of what that concept is supposed to be, um, you see, the other problem I have with it is more for a military reason. If they actually did mean it, why would you declare it publicly before you go do your Operation doesn't that you know give like a does isn't isn't warning the enemy that you're about to attack in an actual well, war isn't that kind of counterintuitive? I mean, I don't know. I don't think that uh, Gordon Call said I'm drawing a line in the sand. I don't think Randy Weaver did. But they uh, when the time came, they drew the line nonetheless, and it was uh, clear to most people that the line had been drawn. Um, yeah, to say it. Uh, it is kind of foolish because you're tempting somebody to come back and, and prove you wrong. So actually, it, it uh, does have a, a kind of a negative effect, I guess, in the long run because uh, uh, who has stood up? Who has declared that they've drawn the line and stood up to it? They have. Many have acted. And I will say that George and Linda probably, at least in private conversation, said we're only going to go so far. You know, there's... Uh, so I have personal knowledge of them not quite drawing a line, but frustrated and willing to resort to violence in defense of their rights. So maybe instead of... They so, not make the public proclamation on the Internet that I've drawn a line. <laughs> right, 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 because that's, that's grandiose uh, uh, standing and where, yeah, they're trying to seem grandiose and what have you. So would it be a better instead to just make a personal, for, for, for every individual to make a decision in their heart about what they are willing to do, do and not do ahead of time, and then that would be the proverbial light of the sand, I guess? Maybe that's not the well, best way it's, it's it. really, it. Well, it's really hard to do in, on an individual basis unless your activity itself is demonstrative of something that might create a scenario whereby that line would be drawn. Hmm. But then you'd be a fool to go public with it. Um, let's okay. Let, let me let, let's assume that there's no public pronouncements. That you just make a decision well, in the quiet of your heart, so to speak. Or or, or is or is it still or is I, the light in the sand still? I, I have that? made I have made one in my heart, and I damn sure ain't going to express it in in public or or to anybody, even in private, to you. Right, right, uh, right. Okay. Um. But what, but what, it's sorry, easier for you to back down if it ever occurs. You know, the, th the funny thing, back, back to those cops breaking in my office. Sure. Uh, when something occurs, you have a split second to make a decision. And it's hard to judge what decision you would make if you've never found yourself in that position. Ah, uh, okay. Well, but when you have militias that claim to have a... Uh, a common pact to defend each other, and then you flee from that. And this goes back to what was called the Republic of Texas, Richard McLaren. Everybody yeah. was back Richard McLaren, and I think I wrote an article on it. I, I, I know I wrote an article on it. I don't know if it's on the Internet, but when uh, they were going after Richard McLaren, um, everybody made excuses. Oh, it's too far. Uh, we can't get there. <laughs> but oh. Excuse for oh, dear God, no. And, these were the militias back in the mid '90s that were doing this. Um, we're going to do that radio show on security team now. Security team's a little different. Our, ours was uh, uh, self defense and a, a communal effort. A small, a very small group of, group of people. And I will say that uh, these people and the only ones that I can name on that seven on the security team were George and Linda and myself. The other people, even though that security team doesn't exist, I will never publicly mention their names. But we had made a commitment. Now, let's see how that worked. When I came back from Texas, we did something deceptive to get the FBI to think. It. I didn't know if there was a concern or not, but the people working with me, we came up with this plan to make it look like I was going to Colorado. 
Uh, and instead, I went back to Orlando. And when I got to Orlando, there were three people armed right outside of the security gate. They couldn't go inside the security back then course, with a gun. Yeah. Of course. Uh, but they were, uh, you could go, if you weren't flying, you could go within. But, you you know, you had to go through the metal detector. So they were waiting outside. And when I walked out of that security, I saw all three of them spread all over in very good positions that if something happened to me after I left the security area at Orlando International Airport, they would have been there to, to defend me. That night, they got me a whole motel room in their name. And they spent the night there. Two of them spent the night with me armed, one of them staying awake all night. We didn't know what the repercussions would be after what I did in Waco in, in trashing the government. Uh, so it worked. Now, later on, George and Linda got arrested. They were concerned they had been using my fax machine at the office. It cost me $800. It was a real nice one back then. Uh, and they had uh, faxed out, and, and there's a, uh, they believed there was a chip in that uh, a uh, fax machine that recorded all the numbers that anything they faxed ever went to and perhaps even kept an image of what they faxed. Mm -hmm. So they were in jail in Opelika, Alabama, and I was up on the Golden Hill Pegasic Reservation in Connecticut. But when I talked to Linda, she wanted that chip destroyed. So I called one of the security team members in Florida, told him where he could get, how he could get a key to get in my office, and his instructions were, and this is in the afternoon, his instructions were take that uh, 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 fax machine out in the uh, swamp uh, with an axe and tear it into as small pieces as possible, look for any electronic chips, take them far away and throw them in a river or a, a stream or something. Right. He called me back about 11 or 12 that evening and said, uh, the deed is done. Now, this is commitment. This is a security team, and these are people standing by what they said they'd do. I woke him up in the middle of the night. Again, when Peter Chernoff and his son Alex and Linda Issel had fled California, there was a half-million-dollar bond on, on uh, Peter Chernoff, or uh, a uh, reward, uh, or bond. No, it was that was a half-million-dollar bond on him. He was fleeing from... Uh, what they called child stealing. I don't remember the exact charge now. Uh, he came to my office, but I was kind of concerned because uh, my secretary had reported white cars going back and forth, and I didn't want to take any chances, so I contacted one of the security team members. Late that night, we moved Peter and Alex and Linda down to his ho house. He had no qualms in standing behind, hiding a fugitive from justice, which can have federal consequences. Uh, had no qualms hiding that person. So these people on the security team had made a commitment. And every time it was tested, it was... Well, they were serious. Without question. Yeah, so it sounds like they were actually serious. So they, you know, again, actions... And just when an incident came up, their response was total commitment. Whatever I have to do. Yeah, and nothing less than that is going to count, I, I would assume. Okay. So, so obviously public, obviously public pronouncements of, of lines is, is, well, I'm going to say it is retarded. So I guess the only thing left is if it's got, if it's already have, has this mythical quality it's to it. It's bravado. It's, it's, a, 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 it's a bully bragging. I can kick your ass. Give me your lunch money. Right, right. It's not, it's not a serious, you know, adult thing of commitment, basically. Um, it's, it's, it's immature. Okay, well then, okay, I guess the only other aspect that's a little bit unclear in my mind then is that is it even worth the effort to, again, in like the private, you know, in your, in your own, you know, the private depths of your heart, I guess, to kind of war game or otherwise try and make a decision ahead of time as to how you will act or all that, or is doing that ahead of time, and obviously you don't talk about it, obviously, but, do, but is doing that ahead of time what you're willing to do and not do, or at least war game it, is that even worth it, or do you just act whenever something comes up? Well, if it's individual, I mean, yeah, I don't know saying. how that's what I'm I would saying. react. I know how I think I would react, but I, I know that I've been there. I had those guns. Um, but, I, I, you know, how do you define the circumstances that give you enough time, uh, accessibility and all that to define it? You don't. And uh, so until you get there, you can't. So can you really draw a line? Okay, let's draw a line. Let's see how many different 
scenarios can occur that I want to draw a line on. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, okay, let me take, let me... Uh, let me some, get back with you next month when I've finished <laughs> at least half the list. Could I, can we do that? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'll tell you what it's worth when somebody draws the line. It's worth this, a chuckle, because every time I see it, I kind of chuckle to myself, because this is bullshit. Yeah. You and, can't see that. Yeah, and actually, that kind of assume you mentioned that, because I think I remember talking to you a while back, and I think I mentioned something about how I was upset or thinking that, well... I was just postulating this before, but that um, you know, if if a if a Chinese if a Chinese style one child policy was ever enforced here in these United States, then maybe you know the guy should you know take up you know take up arms and and secure our liberties that way, and I, and and I think what you mentioned to me before I think kind of plays in hand like. That's not necessarily, you know, why why use that as a benchmark? <laughs> well, that's a safe one. Yeah, yeah. It can but... have in your lifetime, man. You can probably honestly say that. Whether you would do anything if that occurred or not, you will probably never find out. So you're a lot safer than saying that when they go after a militia, I'm going to go. That's the line. So, so even something like that, it, it's so the, so that at the end of the day, it's still the, it's still worth a chuckle, though. Okay, so at the end of the day, all things considered, looking at this backwards, forwards, inside out, et cetera, et cetera, from as many angles as possible, the whole line in the sand concept is is not just mythical; it's intellectually dishonest. Intellectually dishonest and, and publicly dishonest, you know. I, I mean, it's both. It's a it's a fraud. Okay. Well, I then go. I guess then, kind of uh, coming back full circle um, to to the Alamo. Then, I mean, then are people are are people, especially in the Patriot community, extrapolating and have been extrapolating oh. too much from what Colonel let's Travis look, did. Let's, let's look back at the Alamo. There was a pretty done deal there. Yeah. You either stay or you go. If you stay, how many sol uh, soldiers did Santana have? I don't remember the precise numbers, it but it was thousands. It was it was a lot 6, of people, something it, like that. Yeah, it was a real army. Yeah, it was a bruise. That's a done bad. deal. You stay, you're going to die. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's not ambiguous. Like if a mil militia is attacked, uh, then we're going to defend them, unless the government says they're bad guys. Um, so you know, you can have a situation. Uh, where, where that commitment could be made. Uh, let's let's just say, for example, uh, a militia is on a, an FTX and they got 20, 30 guys there, and then the government surrounds them and say, you're under arrest. Well, at that point, we can draw a definitive line in the sand. Who's going to go out with their hands? Oh, in fact, it happened at Waco. Who's going to go <laughs> out with their hands up? Yeah. And who's not? Who's going to stand here because of our beliefs? So you can run into something where you can draw the line in the sand nowadays if you're unfortunate enough to be in the wrong place at the wrong time or the right place at the wrong right time, whether you want to be true to your what you say or you want to try and avoid anything that would require a, a, a real commitment, a life commitment to something. That sounds like an exception so, to the rule, though, because most of the time people are... But it uh, would be. See, we're back to the Alamo, though, where it's specific. Are, okay, are you going to come out with your hands up or are you going to fight and die? Yeah, and unfortunately what we're dealing with in, our, in the attempt to try to secure our liberties is that most people in the Patriot community, and you know, myself included and whatnot, are not... Our, our normal day in and day out activities are not a last hand type situation. <laughs> no, they're not. And so it's easy to say because they're not in a position to have that commitment proven. Uh, All, so that's they can the... express it freely. Uh, they can look really brave by doing that. <laughs> Quote unquote brave. So that, so what you're saying is that that's how the self-deception works then. Okay. So, so basically the takeaway, the lesson to be learned here. If I'm if I'm if I'm thinking this right, is that it's a myth. The line, the concept, saying as it is commonly understood in, in in political dissident circles, and especially the patriot community, is it's a myth. It's fraudulent and it's intellectually dishonest. Well, let's look at the current gun control. Let's look at it now. Uh, gun control. If they pass this law, that's the line in the sand. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm not going to turn wait my guns in. I'm not going to turn wait, my guns in. That's you, the claim. I'll, I'll tell you quite frankly. Um, if I had guns, I wouldn't turn them in. I'll tell you quite frankly that those laws don't apply to me. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And, and I know they don't. Now, the problem is if, and this is, I think you've heard me say this before, my biggest problem is if I have a gun and a cop stops me and he sees the gun and he thinks I don't have a right to have that gun and I know that I do, what are the consequences? Now, at that point, I have to draw that line. In my mind, at least, I'm not going to have time to advertise it on the Internet, but I <laughs> will have to draw that line if that occurs. It will depend a lot on the circumstances. So you have to do it at the time it happens. You can't war right? game it way ahead of time. Okay. Well, George fired the first shot at the cop. The cop had reached for his gun. George screw his gun. The cop ran back with his hand still on the on the uh, gun in his holster, ran back and hid behind his car door. George started shooting at him. The cop then drew his gun and started shooting at George. Linda was on the payphone nearby. She heard the shooting, looked out, saw what was happening. So she dropped the phone, came around behind the cop and shot him from in the back. They called it cowardly. Yeah. Well, shit, when somebody's trying to kill your husband, is it cow- cowardly? To uh, keep yourself out of that line of fire and sneak up behind. Military tactic, man. Flank them. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, gee. Please uh, do it all the time. We've got you (laughs) surrounded. Come out with your hands up. They've got snipers that are put a bullet through your head. And it's cowardly for her to defend her husband's life? Yeah, yeah, obviously. Obviously, that's George didn't have a door to hide behind. Not that doors do much good. That's... (laughs) The difference between concealment and cover. Oh, God, yeah. That, that. Cover stops bullets. Concealment stops visual observation. That door, <laughs> unless they put Kevlar in cop doors, <laughs> uh, that door is concealment. It's not cover. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Gary, I think, I think you know, talking with you about this has really kind of settled a lot of the um, qualms in my mind. And I, I, think, I think I'll also write an article about this, but... I actually feel a lot better talking about this now because I, I, I feel now that I can actually have some sense of closure when it comes to this particular concept. Because to me initially, it seemed like there were some good aspects to it, obviously, but it also seemed like there were some perverse aspects to it. And now that you've helped me clarify what's really been going on and helped help me think this through... Um, I think I think I know how to. Uh, I think I know what I what I need to do on this one. And I think what I'm going to do is, besides writing an article about it, I think I'm going to pretty much close the book on it because it's 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 a distraction, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you've been made understatements before. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> distraction is a very polite way. Uh, I mean, like I say, it's a chuckle when I see it. Yes, yes. Okay, well. It's not a distraction, not at all. I mean, what I've done is learn something about the person that uh, that has bravado, and I've got to question whether he thinks, whether he really means what he says. Well, what I meant by distraction was simply just uh, believing in the concept that it is, it is commonly understood in uh, the alternative media. But yes, I have learned something very much, and I do think that's valuable. So uh, thank you for that. I really do appreciate it. Well, you just slid along that line a little bit more towards the right. Hey, hey i got to make some progress, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Okay. I'll talk to you later. All right, bye.